On this week's We Come From the Future, it's all about art. Art from movies, art from science, and io9 editor Lauren Davis is here with the web comics you should be reading. We'll also take a look at art from Alien and Prometheus, the upcoming prequel to Alien. Which one has better art direction and what does it mean? Plus, the art of blowing up your breakfast using science. All this and more on We Come From the Future. This episode of We Come From the Future is brought to you by HostGator. Hello, and welcome to We Come From the Future, the show where we let you choose one of two fabulous futures or a lifetime supply of aerosol soup. I'm Annalie Newitz. And I'm Esther Inglis Arkell. Today, we're looking at people who sketch the future on paper in our art episode. But first, the news. One of the great mysteries of the ancient world is closer to being solved. The Indus Valley Civilization was a collection of vast cities and farms that existed about 5,000 years ago, where today you have northern India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. But then suddenly, about 3,000 years ago, the cities were completely abandoned, and nobody knows why. But now, this week, a research effort of an international group of geologists has uncovered a possible reason why these cities fell. The cities were built during a time when the monsoons in the region had started to peter out, but not enough that they left the area parched. But over time, the monsoons went away completely, the rainfall stopped, and the area could no longer sustain large cities. So basically what we have here is possibly the first example of climate change destroying one of the biggest cities on Earth. And also from the Department of Urban Dystopia, we've been hearing about a plan from Detroit Mayor Dave Bing to shrink the size of his city by turning off the power to the streetlights in roughly half its neighborhoods. His rationale is that the city's population has shrunk to nearly half the size it was in the 1950s, and some neighborhoods are only about 10% occupied. So Bing hopes to empty these places out and push people to the more populous areas by plunging the streets into darkness. I think we can be pretty sure that Robocop would not approve. North Carolina is making a strong bid for being the craziest state in the union by outlawing certain graphs. Faced with the fact that sea levels are scheduled to rise increasingly fast over the next century, a bill is being circulated that would force all graphs of future sea levels to only be able to show sea levels increasing in straight lines without any of those worrying upward curves. Two other graph-related bills are also slated to be voted upon. One would call for all pie graphs to literally be made out of apple pie, and the other would make it illegal for anyone under 21 to be admitted into a space with a bar graph. DC Comics has announced that Alan Scott, the original Green Lantern, will from now on be written as gay. Alan Scott is probably the most well-known for being the anonymous comics character who was going to be written as gay before everyone found out that that character was Alan Scott. Speaking of comics, on this week's This Is Awesome, we're going to tell you about the web comics you should be reading right now. This week we have special guest Lauren Davis. She is Io9's weekend editor, and she also writes a weekly column for us on webcomics. And she's here today to talk to us about some of her favorite webcomics this week. So welcome, Lauren. Thank you. Uh, thanks for being here. And we're going to start by, I want, I'm really curious about whether or not there are any webcomics that you think stand out both for art and for story that kind of they enhance each other, you know, the art enhances the story and vice versa. Certainly. Um, for example, uh, one of my favorite web comics that I think everybody really should be re reading is Carl Kershaw's um, The Abominable Charles Christopher, which is a really beautiful web comic, a really funny, very touching, sometimes very sad web comic um, about a Yeti who's traveling through a forest and um, is going to be dealing with the encroaching human population. And what's really astounding about what Carl Kirsch does is he does this amazing job of portraying the natural world. The, most of the characters are foxes and skunks and raccoons and birds. And all these characters talk except for the Yeti. And so while you have all of these very um, chit-chatting, very expressive animals, you have this very silent Yeti. And so it really puts, a, puts the onus on Kirschel to make, to really act 
through the Yeti character and really make the emotions clear through what the Yeti is doing. And he just does a really astounding job of doing that. So it sounds like this is really what we call in the science fiction world, world building. Like building out a whole world of creatures who are talking to each other and having businesses and stuff. So ha what are some other web comics that you think do a great job with just that whole building out of the world? Um, certainly one that does a really beautiful job is um, Ellie on Planet X by James Anderson, which is about a little, a little cat-shaped robot explorer who goes off to explore this distant planet and she encounters all of the, the different uh, aliens who are who are living there and it's really you know you get these really spectacular beautiful scenes and um, you know but and these very whimsically designed aliens and you know he he does a great job of just creating a very distinct look for his planet and um, it's, it's a very sweet comic it's a very child-friendly comic um, but just really strong in terms of, of just the, the whimsy and the design and the world and you, you feel like this is a place that you really would like to visit. So what about, um, what happens when a webcomic is actually put into print? Like, you know, because I know some of them do go to print, like is there a change between, you know, the web version and the print version? Well, that's a great question and actually one of my favorite webcomics just came out in print. You have um, the book right here. I have the book right here. It's Dice Box by Jen Manley Lee and this is just a really, really lovely comic. Um, an incredibly complex comic. Um, it's about two migrant workers who are traveling the galaxy from job to job to job. And it's really, I mean, speaking of world building, it's a really richly detailed world. I mean, she details all of the different planets and the, the character design and the costume. It's all incredibly detailed. And you really do feel like you're stepping into this, this future world. And what's very interesting is when you read it in print, it's a very different experience reading it in print because, you know, the characters will reveal little things about themselves. And you think, oh, has that character always been missing a finger? And then you flip back through the pages and it's a lot, it's a, it's a much different experience being able to flip back very quickly um, in print as opposed to on the web where you sit there and you rack your brain and you think about, was there something that I missed? Um, so it's definitely a very different uh, experience reading it in print. And, and I think that there's you know a lot to be said for experiencing it both ways. So are there any other, I mean this dice box sounds like an amazing far, sort of far future um, comic book. Are there any other um, web comics that are science fiction that you think like we have to read right now? Um, one comic that I've really been enjoying is American Barbarian by Tom Scioli. It's uh, very heavily inspired by Jack Kirby and um, just this amazing kind of 70s retro futurism to it. And it takes place in a, in a very, very far flung future where you have, you have characters who have very different, uh, very different technological advancements. And so you get, um, on the one hand, these very sort of primitive medieval style barbarians who all have red, white, and blue hair, which is fabulous. Well, of course, as you do. <laughs> as you do. <laughs> um, but then you have you have people who who you know go about in these roving cities and have you know access to time travel and. Um, robotic dinosaurs and it's just okay yeah you had me at robotic dinosaurs <laughs> <laughs> it's a very fun comic all right well that, that was, those were four really great recommendations so thanks very much for coming on and telling us what we should be reading and what you should be clicking on right now um, and hope to have you back to talk more about web comics another time it's time now to see what happens when you take a bowl of cereal, some milk, a straw, and a lot of free time on this week's Esther Gets Experimental. Okay, it's now time for Esther Gets Experimental, the part of the show where I get to play a mad scientist. Today we're doing one of Annalise's favorite experiments. It's called the drinking straw pump, and it's what you really need when there's a fiery apocalypse and the power goes out or when you're bored at breakfast and want to annoy the person sitting next to you. Yes, it's an excellent breakfast obnoxiousness experiment. So basically you just need a couple of straws that you've configured into this shape um, and you just need some milk and cereal. Here's one straw and then we have these, this one other straw cut into three pieces. Now let me show you how it works and Esther, what, what's happening here? Have you ever been on that carnival ride where it twirls you around and you get stuck against the side and then you start moving up? 
Well, this does what the carnival ride did to you, but it does it to milk. The, the milk is getting sucked up. Yep, it's well, it's not getting sucked up. It's getting pushed around. And because the straw is at an angle, it's basically oh. easier for the water to to go up the to side. To kind of roll up the side the way you do on the carnival ride than it usually does getting pulled down by gravity. Excellent. All right, so this is a uh, also a technique that was used in um, ancient civilizations to actually pump water out of the ground and um, it's also uh, just a great, you know, conversation starter at breakfast, a nice way to annoy people sitting next to you at breakfast in the dorms. Um, you know, just generally a terrific thing to do, especially with, with milk because it, you know, the smell just lingers with you all day long. Um, do it with be, the lactose intolerant. Especially for the lactose intolerant. Uh, so there's more We Come From The Future coming up next, but first, a word from our sponsor. HostGator can get your blog or website up and running in minutes. With plans starting at just $3.96 per month, you get 24-7 support and access to website building tools with over 4,000 templates. They'll even migrate your current site for free. HostGator's servers are 130% powered by wind energy. For Revision 3 viewers, HostGator is offering 25% off your order or your first month free. Just go to HostGator.com and enter the code FUTUREV3 at checkout. The only thing that gets me more excited than blowing up breakfast is art from awesome movies. People really forget that movies start out in the hands of concept artists who create hundreds of paintings of everything from interior designs to the creatures in the films, and that that's often kind of the most compelling part of the movie, what's taking place long before it starts filming. Yeah, I think the the concept art for both Alien and Prometheus really set the tone for both from the ground up because Ridley Scott said the earliest sketches for the Alien ship were based on a tugboat, but the earliest sketches for the Prometheus ship were based on the Hawker Hunter, a, a aerospace jet. Mm -hmm. People and, are saying on the internet it also look, looks a lot like Serenity. Yeah, so when you've got a, a setting, basically they've set Aliens in a world where the main characters are miners and truck drivers, so the space equivalent of that. Yeah. And Prometheus is set in a world where the main characters are military, scientists, and tech people. It's a completely different feel and a different way to approach the creature both times. And yeah, and also, like, in Prometheus, what we see when you look at a lot of the art that's been released is this kind of... The, we're seeing these mo this monumental architecture. And so not only are our characters a more upper class group, but they're also seeking these aliens who are these kind of elevated creatures who may have actually seeded the universe with, with life. We don't know. And so the, it's, not, it's not like an alien where we're dealing with basically kind of low class monsters who Ridley Scott has actually said are probably just biological weapons that were owned by these elevated creatures that we we haven't met yet and so it's kind of like truckers versus these like crappy like trash aliens <laughs> and you know people always forget that this um, the alien design came from H.R. Geiger a Swiss artist who was kind of working with this industrial goth aesthetic that was really popular in the late 70s. I guess that's true I guess the, it is more an industrial look to it and I, I always thought of the alien as being sort of kind of sleek and and they said it's designed as the perfect weapon yeah and it's purity yeah um, so I guess in in some ways it's a, a struggle of like the industrial machines versus like the perfect machine yeah and but it's also like the industrial machines fighting back against the truckers and stuff who are the people that like run the machines and I think we're seeing that a lot in in especially in the early alien films and um, you know, also though, the alien is perfect, but it's it drools a lot. Like it's kind of <laughs> it's kind of f***ed up in a certain way too. Like it's a machine that's kind of not perfect. Like there's a bunch of goo and oil coming off of it or something like that. Whereas in Prometheus, we just get like I said, the designs are just these huge like almost church-like, you know, interiors. Yeah, it's kind of your it's so clean and futuristic looking the way we would think of the future. Whereas I guess the alien is how people in the future would think of the present, which is grubby, just like any other present. Mm-hmm. 
It's interesting. I'm going to be very curious. A lot of early reviews of Prometheus have said that the art is one of the best parts of the film. So I think it'll be, it'll yeah. be interesting to see it play out. So what we get is from these early sketches develop two films that are kind of about intergalactic class struggle. And that amazing insight wraps up this episode of We Come From The Future. Remember that you can subscribe to us on iTunes by doing a search for io9 and clicking the subscribe button. You can also subscribe to us on YouTube, and you can always find us right here on Revision 3. I'm Annalie Newitz. And I'm Esther Inglis Arkell. We'll see you next time when a giant alien will, like, burst out of your chest and try to take over the future, and you'll, like, fight it with hammers and, like, dude! Dude.